Hello everyone, we are here in the last installment of our week on fashion in the post-independence India and uh, we have already discussed some of the impact of the Vishwakarma exhibitions and this, this uh, the spirit of experimentations that took place during the 1980s and 1990s. But then apart from the Vishwakarma exhibitions, we also find that there were individuals who were involved in, in doing certain kind of experiments and those experiments were perhaps not really directed towards uh, uh, making an impressive textile which would be there for an international audience to think about like the capacity and capability of the Indian artisans but perhaps to reclaim certain parts of the past or perhaps reclaiming certain parts of the identity which was lost during the either during like I mean the, the partition of the Indian subcontinent or like some of the developments that took place in the later uh, 20th century. So those things we can find that to be there with some of the individuals and in this installment we'll be talking about some of those people here so this this uh, the topic that we have for this week i mean uh, for for this installment is sustainability slow fashion and their social impact and so sustainability when we talk about this idea of sustainability we see that this is something that has to do with a conscious and mindful way of textile making or craft making so textile sector as we know that this is one of the largest sectors in India today and also like I mean of course in a, a number of producer countries but then textile sector if we think about the factory based production for textile making is also one of the most polluting sectors that we find in anywhere that has been practiced. So when we think about the traditional way of making textile like the hand spun, hand woven and natural dyed textiles which will certainly be a lot less polluting and then and then like I mean the water and the other material which are used in this kind of textile making can readily go back to the field and that would not harm the water bodies or the or the soil or anything else whereas we find that that uh, the factory based textile production is something that that the the production of the fumes the kind of like the the residue that goes to the water the water channels the rivers and everything else all of them they cause a lot of harm to the environment now also we understand the fact that the natural diet textiles cannot really serve the entire population that we have in our country or the international uh, um, the population where where india exports so for that reason there needs to be an understanding of how to strike a balance between this this fast way of production and then like understanding certain responsibility towards sustainability for for us so sustainability we need to understand that i mean what are the things which are not just in terms of like the use of material and and uh, um, use of techniques uh, or, or their impact on the environment is considered as sustainable but also we need to understand that what sustains the artisanal livelihood so those things need also those things also need to be considered when we consider this idea about of sustainability now then comes the idea of slow fashion and slow fashion is something that we see that that gained momentum from like early 2000s and after mostly after like i mean 2010 and so on and in which we see that slow fashion is something that came as a response after this fast fashion in which we see the designer brands all across the world they sort of employ people in the developing countries or in the underprivileged countries for producing um, uh, uh, cloths which would be produced in a mass production scale and then the the the, the workers are given uh, minimum wages but then uh, of course like i mean the designer brands and the companies that they, they would have like i mean maximum profit out of it so in this way we see that there is this uh, uh, mass production and that that reaches a wide audience but then a lot of times we do not understand uh, we, we do not really understand that i mean and what kind of impact it creates when when um, we use them so we also take part in this this uh, the system of value and system of like i mean uh, um, of course that i mean creating uh, uh, creating certain changes in the livelihood of the people so instead of uh, thinking about this fast fashion in which this mindless mass production of things that happen 
if we think about slow fashion in which like the consumers and the producers are both aware of the 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 ill that is created by fast fashion and also like i mean uh, we 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 become aware of our own requirement that instead of like i mean buying 10 clothes at one go if we buy one or two which are just required for us then we might be able to sort of think about that how mindfully these fabrics or the clothes can be produced and and instead of like i mean buying 10 things which would probably uh, be less expensive than than those two things we we actually co contribute to the money of the um, uh, of the sort of like i mean the organizations which exploit labors and which exploit like i mean the resources so this this kind of understanding which is not just there for the producers but also equally for the consumers is something that we find that sort of is is uh, addressed in this idea of slow fashion in which we do not really consider that the fast fashion or like i mean the, the trends the way we understand in the fashion industry that that lasts for a very uh, brief period of time and then it sort of like i mean falls out of practice those kind of things are not encouraged and then ra instead of that we see that the mindful production and and being aware of our own requirement is something that is prioritized so those kind of things we see them to be there uh, um, um, in the understanding of slow fashion so sustainability slow fashion these two things are integrally connected and as we see that i mean this kind of understanding this kind of consciousness it also has a huge social impact in terms of when we think that i mean how it goes back to the producer community then if we choose that mindfully produced fabric which are made by the artisanal communities by the cooperatives and so on we directly benefit them we also become aware of like the the benefits and the ills of different kind of textiles and and of course like i mean by that we also become aware of all the things that surround our life the the material culture around us so it is not just a way in which we are empowering the uh, livelihood of the artisans but we can also make a huge impact on our own lifestyle as well so those are the reasons we find that sustainability slow fashion all those things they are not just about um, empowering the, uh, the the livelihood or the the, the state of life of, of um, the artisanal communities or the producer communities but it is something that impact all our lives now with that I'd like to discuss a few case studies and again we are back in Hyderabad and here I want to talk about this one particular workshop which has recently been closed down and that is that was established by Suraya Hassan Bose and Suraya Hassan was someone who came from a family from the in Hyderabad who were involved in the nationalist struggle and the anti-colonial resistance from early 20th century and her father was someone who established a cottage industry to promote the craft object from the region the Lugu speaking region mostly from the Deccan region and then of course we see that the bonfire of foreign clothes something that came up in Gandhi's Khadi movement in 1920s and so on that also took place in their home in 1920s so Surai Hassan came from this family where she experienced this this um, the anti-colonial resistance and then in the 1950s she extensively worked worked with uh, uh, Pupul Jaikar and, and some of the other people in the craft sector and so that is how she expanded her um, understanding of craft making and its social impact. So in the in 1980s we see that her uh, uncle Abid Hassan Safrani who, who um, uh, he, he, he was also a freedom fighter and then he donated this land to Suraya Hassan and then Suraya Pat she took up this place and then first established a farm and then like I mean then she established a weaving unit in one of the sections of this land which was then situated in this Darga neighborhood of Hyderabad I mean of course this weaving unit that was there it, it lasted at least until 2020 uh, 2021 but then it was sort of like I mean this, this land was sold off to someone else and then this workshop uh, had its sad demise there now what Surayapa did during this time in the 1980s was she was interested in 
sort of reviving certain traditions, textile traditions which were lost. So, for example, she revived Himru textiles, which is again, it's an Indo-Persian weave. It's a highly specialized brocade weaving in which we find both like, I mean, this, this cotton and silk is there and then extra weft is added for making these patterns on this Himru textile. So, Himru is something we, we can see in the right side of the image. Here, Suraya Appa, she is holding a piece of Himru textile from her collection. So, when she established this uh, uh, this this workshop in 1980s, she uh, invited master weaver Umar Said, and Umar Said she he was responsible for setting up the himru and mushru uh, looms in her workshop. And eventually, like the Pathani border, like Pathani is this other uh, uh, silk and zari weaving tradition that we find in Maharashtra in the Pathan region. And so uh, all those. Uh, um, revival uh, 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 projects were taken up in her small workshop in, in Hyderabad. So, uh, we see that I mean the, the this workshop was not really like a, uh, it was not really meant for producing large number of textile, but this, this slow and steady production technique in which we see that this, this uh, mindful uh, uh, um, method of, of revi reviving certain textile forms which were lost either for partition and, and for other reasons, they were sort of like, I mean, revived and practiced in this place. Now, Suraya Appa was someone who was also, she inherited a lot of this Himru and Mushru and other forms of highly prized brocade textiles from her family collection. And uh, since I have mentioned that, I mean, her father was uh, 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 was responsible to, to establish this cottage industries in Hyderabad in the 1920s. So, one can imagine that they had uh, collected uh, a variety of craft items and then of course, like different kind of textiles and their family also owned a lot of textiles. And, and so, <coughs> some of those Textiles, we find them to be there in Suraya Appa's um, this this cupboard that that lied in the corner of her weaving workshop. So uh, with that, what we see that this this kind of textiles were uh, um, sort of like I mean used as archival material and for reference for for the jala maker uh, as as uh, master uh, uh, weaver Umar Said to sort of see and sort of recreate them and how to how to sort of like I mean make them uh, uh, how to bring them to life by the intervention of the weavers today. Now, in terms of the weavers, what we see that this kind of textile making and in Hyderabad during this time, there were not really too many this traditional weavers who would be there and the men during this time in the 1980s, a lot of them, they aspired to work for uh, the factories and the formal sectors instead of like, I mean, working for the unorganized, this weaving sectors. So, a lot of them, they have already left their jobs or like their, their occupation. So, Suraya Appa became uh, interested to train uh, uh, women, either widowed and then like I mean also the housewives from the neighborhood and then Umar Said was uh, uh, crucial, fundamental for training these women from the neighborhood to, to sort of in, in this um, craft of making this highly prized himru textiles and and we see that i mean this this when this training period was there so suraya appa provided them with a small um, incentive or, or or a fellowship whatever we can understand that and even later on whenever uh, new people joined in this workshop suraya appa made sure to sort of support them during their training period and give them um, a monthly stipend and afterwards when they started working for the weaving unit they were paid um, on a monthly basis and at the same time there was a school that was established this english medium school uh, uh, in the name of abid hasan safrani safrani memorial school it's right beside the weaving unit there so today the weaving unit is demolished but the school still survives and in this school we find that the uh, the, the children from the weavers family they were uh, uh, given education for free and and uh, so so this this kind of services we find that i mean suraya had provided 
for uh, sustaining this 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 forms of textile making there so this these are some of the things we see how a uh, particular uh, kind of interventions like surayappa and some of the other designers or like the textile activist, activists and entrepreneurs they did was not just to think about how to sort of revive certain forms of craft from the past in terms of like reclaiming the cultural past but also when the actual human beings are involved in um, this, this forms of textile production then what different uh, ways in which one can support them was also explored. So this this kind of uh, activities we find that I mean this this uh, not only just made a healthy working atmosphere in these workshops, but also made sure that how to sustain this kind of practices uh, and and showed the path to the future generation designers and and scholars and entrepreneurs that how one can proceed if one is thinking in terms of the collaboration between artisans and of course like the the designers or the other stakeholders the other experiment that we find or perhaps like i mean the other form of sort of reclaiming the past was done by Uzrama again based in Hyderabad and for Uzrama what happened was uh, she was more and more interested in terms of like I mean hand weaving, hand spinning, procurement of cotton and then like I mean utilizing desi cotton for weaving fabric which would be used by common people. So if we think about Himru, Mushru, Paitani those are all highly specialized forms of textiles but then Uzrama was someone who was interested in utilizing the desi varieties of cotton and for that reason her stress remained on the kind of fabric which are used by uh, people on a daily basis and then what we see that I mean she was also someone who's uh, she is also someone who's uh, interested in sort of reconfiguring the, the 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 bond between different producer communities so for example the cotton producers the ginners the spinners the weavers the dyers and so this is the way we see that I mean how this this community bond between these people was something that was lost in the factory, uh, factory mode of production it was something that was revived by like Uzrama's intervention. So in the early 2000s, she established her uh, uh, organization that is Malka and before that she had worked with the Dastakar Andhra uh, uh, for um, um, of, of course for like I mean uh, when, when Dastakar did like extensive documentation in the 1980s and 1990s uh, in the Telugu speaking region Dastakar Andhra and, and uh, uh, of course like I mean uh, she traveled with them and was also involved in sort of uh, uh, studying certain kind of weaving techniques and seeing that how uh, uh, this 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 kind of in uh, um, um, this this kind of activities can can have a lasting effect on the producer communities. During this time, we also find that dye specialist Jagada Rajappa was actively also working with uh, uh, dyers and not only just. Uh, uh, as a, as a consultant for for uh, Dasakar Andhra, but but she was involved and she she was instrumental for teaching dyeing techniques, especially indigo dyeing and some of the other natural dyeing techniques to a large group of dyers, not only in the Telugu speaking and Tamil speaking region, but different parts of the country. And she continues to do this kind of activities in in Western India, in Northeast, and various other parts of the country. So this kind of interventions we find that it, it sort of like uh, uh, brought the focus back to the producer communities and for uh, Uzrama we see that uh, how she had sort of uh, focused on the basic things of production so for example procurement of raw cotton some of the varieties of cotton which were not really prioritized in the mill made cotton production I mean in the mill made yarn production because that the the yarn will not be the yarn will uh, uh, the, in the in the mill certain kind of like cotton which are prioritized which can produce like I mean long fibers and many uh, desi varieties of cotton the indigenous varieties of cotton cannot really 
produce uh, those those long uh, fibers but they have their own qualities so for those reasons hand spinning can um, certainly uh, yield uh, better results and also like i mean if the cotton producers we see that i mean they are discouraged of producing the desi varieties of cotton then we also lose out on the diversity of textile production in the uh, in our country so like interventions by uzramma and then some of the uh, recent uh, textile activists as uh, nagendra satish paludas and and the other people so we find that they sort of brought our attention back to the basics of textile making and it is not a romantic sort of retrieval of the past but then there are sociological meanings or sociological uh, uh, factors which are involved we find them there that why this desi varieties of cotton they they need to be sustained it's not just about like i mean uh, uh, sort of like going back to the pre colonial ideals but then certain kind of cotton production can happen in the in the barren um, lands and and uh, if we do not have those cotton produced in those places and then there are other uh, kind of cottons which are water intensive so so those those kind of cotton should not be uh, cultivated in the barren areas so those those kind of environmental um, factors also need to be taken care of when we think about like what cotton needs to be prioritized so for those reasons like the desi varieties of cotton which can grow in barren places they also need to be folded into this uh, um, the, the production sectors and this kind of interventions in which we see that um, all varieties of cotton can be utilized in textile making that that sort of makes this more inclusive way of production where more uh, cotton farmers and ginners spinners hand spinners especially can be involved i mean of course today that malkha has like i mean few spinning units uh, units in which we see that uh, a half mechanized form of production is also introduced but then like some of the uh, the the ideals upon which malkha was established and then some of the other uh, um, uh, craft activists like uh, nagendra satish paludas and and other people they still focus on hand spinning and and its imp a deep impact in in society now we see that i mean with this kind of activities that some of the brands also today we see that more and more brands they come forward to have acknowledgement of materials techniques and people who are involved in the production so for example here there are two examples and one comes from this organization called brown boy in which like the images of the workers who work in this factory setup to sort of like manufacture the goods like i mean the t-shirts and other things then they are sort of acknowledged in their promotionals and then of course we also see the other kind of acknowledgement comes in terms of like acknowledging the material and that comes from this other campaign in good earth and in which we see that the use of malkha cotton so for example in this jacket and his trouser is then readily acknowledged when these are then tailored into wearable fabrics wearable clothes so this kind kind of acknowledgement that sort of brings our attention back to that the intricacies of material the processes the people who are involved in it some of the things which we tend to ignore when we focus on the final product and that is the wearable fabric or clothes the other form of acknowledgement we key see that i mean when the artisans are also sort of acknowledged in the promotions and this comes from this organization that is janapada khadi from karnataka in which we see that the artisans who wove particular textile so for example the weaver here we see her to wear the sari that she had woven in in her loom and then she her, her image was shared the digital look book of janapada khadi for um, sort of like i mean for, for the consumers to, to sort of buy this sarees and then we also see that the spinner who was involved in like spinning the fabric here is also there and weaver and then this kind of acknowledge 
management we see that how the artisans who usually come in the background are then acknowledged and sort of like brought to the foreground as a, as a conscious strategy to acknowledge them their contribution and also sort of like I mean how this consciousness in terms of like the slow fashion sustaining livelihood and also that our responsibilities all those things are churned by the use of this very consciously created visuals. The other example of this kind of slow and sustainable uh, clothing making we find that to be there in this brand called Sherlo and that is initiated by Tenor Sherlo and he, uh, Tenor Sherlo, he is presently based in Maclod Ganj and in the Dharamshala area of, of Himachal Pradesh and he came to India in a, a very young age as a Tibetan refugee and then what we see that there is this already is kind of there is this struggle about finding his identity. Of course that the Dharamshala area we find there is a concentration of the Tibetan refugees they stay there but in terms of like I mean finding his identity also not only through his his use of language or or the other um, um, the culture but but then also through like the making of textile is something that is exemplified in this brand that is Sherlo. So he works with the Pattu weavers in Himachal Pradesh in which we see this particular form of textile here this twill wool textile that is there in made in the Kangra uh, district of Himachal Pradesh and other parts of Himachal Pradesh as well. And so this Pattu weave is something that was slowly losing its context and relevance among the young weavers and only few are left there to make this kind of weaves and to reclaim this Pattu weave is something that a tenor Sherlo had done and making use of this uh, weave into like I mean making into wearable fabric also sort of using particular motifs in bags and other accessories is something that, that he had consciously done and it is not just a revival of a particular material but we see that there is a parallel between his own experience and the experience of this textile both of them that I mean how he is someone who is displaced from his uh, motherland and then also sort of like I mean whether like this this distance can actually uh, sort of contribute to lose of a particular identity that he had and then like I mean with the uh, with this textile what we see that I mean this this kind of textile is uh, losing its context because of the disinterest of the younger generation also of the consumers. So in both cases we find there is a, a aspect of loss and when tenor sort of looks back at the Pattu weaving and then like I mean this aspect of loss is then sort of uh, 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 not um, uh, taken taken further but then it is the revival is something that we find it's a symbolic retrieval of the identity that that it, it's in the verge of sort of disappearing. So this this kind of like I mean different uh, um, aspects we find them to be there as involved in this this aspect of um, uh, uh, producing sustainable and and slow fashion goods. So to conclude this uh, thing, I'd say that I mean when we see this the fashion in terms of like in the post-independence context, we see that I mean again that there are certain issues we find that how uh, traditional and contemporary textiles like so called timeless textiles and the contemporary ones are brought in conversation with each other and then redefinition of particular kind of textiles which have existed in the South Asian context for a long period of time was also something that was made possible in the uh, late 20th century. And the other thing that also comes here very prominently is that our uh, responsibility towards the textile makers, our responsibility towards the producers and our responsibility towards the environment and how our conscious choices can make a huge deal of difference in terms of how we understand fashion and its impact on our lives. Thank you.